Okay, well, let's continue. Let's talk about uh, Lewis dot structures a little bit more. Uh, we talked about what to do if you have just enough electrons to go around. That was nice and convenient. So what do you do if you don't have enough electrons, and what do you do if you have too many? Well, the answer is, is pretty simple. And by the time we get through with this, you should be able to draw any Lewis dot structure that I uh, attempt to throw at you. So let's take a look at the, the too few electrons case first. So what do you do if you don't have enough electrons to go around? Well, uh, that's where you try to form multiple bonds. Okay? So uh, a great example of that would be uh, your nitrate polyatomic ion. That's an NO3 with a minus charge, right? So what does nitrate look like? Well, first thing we do, count the number of electrons available. All right, so what do we got? Well, we've got uh, a nitrogen here, which is in group 15. So again, cover up the 1, put, take the 5. Or if you have a periodic table that numbers at least 5a or 5b, just take the 5. Uh, so you have 5 valence electrons there. You've got 3 oxygens, each in group 16. That's your periodic table. Uh, so 3 times 6 there. And then you've got this negative charge, and that means there's one extra electron in there somewhere. So you're going to add one. Add for negative charge, subtract from positive charge because electrons have a negative one charge, so it's my opposite there. So 3 times 6 is 18, plus 1 is 19, 19 and 5, 24 electrons total to work with. Okay, what do we do in step 2? Well, that's where we draw our skeleton structure. So the first atom in the formula is generally your first atom, or your central atom. Oxygens and halogens and hydrogens tend to be around the outside. So maybe a nitrogen in the middle here and then three oxygens around the outside. That's a negative charge there. Okay. Now we're going to subtract two electrons for each bond in our skeleton structure. So we used up two, four, six. So 24 minus six gives me 18 electrons. So here we go. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen. How many around this oxygen? So eight, stable, yeah. This oxygen, eight. See, this is a pair, two, four, six, eight. And this oxygen, eight, stable. So we're done, right? Well, that's the problem. Well, the problem is I only have six electrons around this nitrogen right here. Well, that's three out of four. That's close enough, isn't it? not close enough. So what are we going to do? Well, here's what we're going to do. Uh, we're going to share another pair of electrons here. Now, there's two ways you can do this. You can either just erase one of these pairs and put a double bond right here, and you can do that. Uh, sometimes you kind of lose track of what you erased and what you wrote in and this and that. So I prefer just to go back to the skeleton structure and then put uh, a double bond. Okay? And that's what those two lines represent, is they represent two shared pairs of electrons, or four electrons. All right, okay, so I originally had 24. How many I use up this time? Well, I used up 8, 2, 4, 6, 8. Okay. 24 minus 8 is 16. Now, it may seem like we're going backwards, but we're really not. Watch. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. How many electrons are on this oxygen right here? Well, 8, 2, 4, 6, 8. How many around this oxygen right here? Well, 8, 2, 4, 6, 8. How many around this oxygen down here? Well, I have 8, 2, 4, 6, 8. See, each of those lines is a pair of electrons. Does everybody see eight electrons around this oxygen right here? So it's two, four, six, eight. Okay. How many electrons do I have around this nitrogen now? Two, four, six, eight. Stable? Yes. You would expect nitrate to exist as a nitrogen bond with three oxygens. One of those would be an oxygen oxygen double bond. One of those would be or two of those could be nitrogen oxygen single bond. One of these electrons in here is extra. Which one? Don't know. 
don't care, don't have to know. I just know there's one in there. And again, this is this is why nitrate has a minus one charge. If you didn't have that extra electron in there, and you didn't have that double bond in there, you wouldn't be able to get eight electrons around each atom. But by putting that one extra electron in there, that's what makes it work. And that's why it has a minus one charge, not a minus two or a minus three or a plus four. It's minus one. See? All right. And so, moral of the story, um, if, if you don't have enough electrons to go around, try putting a double bond in there. See if that works. Okay? So, what are you breathing in right now? Well, oxygen, right? That's what they tell you in biology. What are you really breathing in right now, mostly? Well, actually about 78% of what you're breathing in is not oxygen, it's actually nitrogen. Okay? Um, about 21% roughly of what you're breathing in is actually oxygen. It's just that that is what you're using. And so in biology they tell you you're breathing in oxygen. When in reality, you're probably breathing in oxygen and nitrogen. Well, not probably, but you are. What are you exhaling? Well, they tell you it's carbon dioxide. Is that true? Well, kind of. But mostly what you're exhaling is that nitrogen you didn't use. You're also exhaling uh, oxygen that you didn't use. You know, this is why mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation works. If you just breathe in CO2 into someone's lungs, I mean, that really wouldn't be any use. Uh, and you're breathing out some CO2 to produce. But, you know, I get it, you know, you, you're using the oxygen and you're producing CO2, so that's why they tell you that. It's kind of a shortcut. But, yeah, in reality, you're actually breathing in and out mostly nitrogen. Right. So, oxygen. You don't find little individual oxygen atoms kind of floating around all over the place. What you find oxygen as is you find it as an O2 molecule most of the time. So, why do you find oxygen as an O2 molecule? Well, let's draw the dot structure. So here's my O2. How many electrons do I have? Well, I have two oxygens, each at six valence electrons apiece, group number. So I got a total of 12. No charge, so I'm not adding anything. All right. Uh, you'd be hard pressed to find any other way to put them together than this. This is pretty much it. Uh, how many did I use in my skeleton structure? Well, two. So 12 minus two, 10 electrons left. All right. So let's distribute the 10 electrons. One, two, three, four, five. 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. How many around this oxygen? 7. Stable? No. How many around this oxygen? 7. 2, 4, 6, 7. Stable? No. Would you expect oxygen to exist as a diatomic molecule with a single bond between those two oxygens? No, you would not expect that um, because you don't have 8 valence electrons around either of the atoms. And you're right, it does not exist that way. If I had two more electrons, that would make things work out perfectly. But I don't have two more electrons. You know, I have to make do with 12. If I had 14, it would be great, but I don't. You know, if I had enough money to buy a Ferrari, I guess I would buy myself a Ferrari. But I just don't have that. You know, wishing does not make it so. So, what are we going to do? Well, we don't have enough electrons to go around. So, let's go back in and let's put a double bond in between these two oxygen atoms. All right? And a double bond is two shared pairs of electrons. All right. So we originally had 12. This time we used up four. How many do we have left? We have eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. How many electrons do I have around this oxygen atom right here? Two, four, six, eight. Stable? Yes. How many electrons do I have around this oxygen atom here? Two, four, six, eight. Stable? Yes. Would you expect oxygen to exist as a diatomic molecule with a double bond between the two oxygen atoms? Yes, because each of those atoms now has that nice noble gas structure, and so yeah, you would expect that to be uh, the case. Is that what you really see when you go out there into the real world? That's actually what you see. When you look in the atmosphere and you find oxygen, you find it as a diatomic molecule. Uh, single bonds tend to be longer and they tend to be weaker, less a little overlap, we'll talk about it. Double bonds tend to be shorter and 
and stronger because there's more overlap there. When you look at the bond length between those two oxygen atoms in an O2 molecule, you will find that it corresponds to a bond length of an oxygen-oxygen double bond. So see, you, you have drawn dots on a piece of paper, you counted to eight, and you have made a real prediction about the world around you. And lo and behold, when you actually go out there and look, that prediction is actually true. The very powerful theory it explains a lot of things for very, very little effort. It doesn't take you years to learn this. Okay, well, as we said before, what are you actually mostly breathing in? You're actually mostly breathing in nitrogen, right? Well, it turns out you find nitrogen as an N2 molecule. It's a, what we call a diatomic gas as well. Why? Well, let's draw the dot structure. So nitrogen's in group 15, so five valence electrons, seven total, but again, you're looking at the valence, you're not looking at the total, so don't do that. So two of those times five, ten electrons total to work with. Uh, skeleton structure, yeah, probably that. Uh, two electrons used, ten minus two is eight, so I get something like this. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. How many around this nitrogen right here? Two, four, six. Stable? No. How many around this nitrogen? Two, four, six. Stable? No. Would you expect nitrogen to exist as an N2 molecule with a single bond? No. Right. Again, not enough electrons to go around. So let's, let's try what we did with the oxygen. Maybe that'll work. So we'll go back up here. We'll put a double bond between the two nitrogen. Well, I originally had 10. This time I used 4, which is a pair. So I have 6 electrons left. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. How many around this nitrogen right here? 2, 4, 5, 6, 7. Stable? No. How many around this nitrogen? 2, 4, 6, 7. Stable? No. Uh, by the way, there are some nitrogen compounds called auto electron molecules where you actually do have seven around the nitrogen, and it's, it's okay with that. All right. This is not one of those. So, yeah, it's not stable. All right. But isn't seven closer to eight than six? So, I guess we're making progress. So, what are we going to do now? Well, let's share another pair. Well, sharing that, that, pair last, that extra pair last time seemed to help us a little bit. So let's share another pair. And then you end up with something called a triple bond. And a triple bond is three shared pairs of electrons. All right? So originally I had 10. This time I used up what? Two, four, six. Each of those lines is a pair. How many do I have left? I have four electrons left. One, two, three. How many electrons do I have around this nitrogen atom right here? Two, four, six, eight. Stable? Yes. How many electrons do I have around this nitrogen atom right here? Eight. Two, four, six, eight. Stable? Yes. Would you expect nitrogen to exist as a diatomic gas with a triple bond between those two nitrogen atoms? Yes. Is that what you actually see? Yes, that's actually what you see. The bond length and bond strength is consistent with the nitrogen oxygen triple bond. Again, you made a prediction. You went out into the real world, you looked around, and that prediction came true. That's what good theories do. They make predictions, and the predictions they make actually, actually are true. Make sense? Nitrogen is, is known as a somewhat inert gas. It doesn't react. It's not a noble gas by any means, but, but it's not as reactive with oxygen. You know, one of those reasons why uh, is, look at that triple bond. See, to get this nitrogen to react, you, you've got to break that nitrogen-nitrogen triple bond. That's going to take a lot of energy. You know, when we talk about bond energies and things, which, by the way, we talked about that back in the thermodynamics chapter. You are not responsible for bond energies in this chapter. Uh, I won't even throw lattice in um, but uh, yeah, that you've got to break that bond. That's going to take a lot of energy um, to do.
And so that's one reason why nitrogen is less reactive than oxygen, uh, is that, which is good because most of the Earth's atmosphere is nitrogen. I mean, if you had a, 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 an atmosphere of like gasoline vapor, then every time you lit a match, the whole planet would blow up. And that's not good. So I guess it is kind of a good thing it's somewhat inert. It's not argon or helium inert, but it's uh, somewhat. And that's probably the reason why it works. Okay? Moral of the story. Uh, if you don't have enough electrons to go around, too few electrons to go around, try putting a double or a bond in there. If that doesn't work, try putting another double bond in there, or try putting a triple bond in there, and, and maybe that will get you where you need to go. Um, there's a saying in, in the medical field, you know, when you see hoof prints, um, look for horses, don't look for zebras. Uh, in other words, you know, I, I'll see students and they will, every time they draw a molecule, they'll just, they'll just start putting multiple bonds in there willy-nilly all over the place. They'll put a double bond in here and a triple over here. No rhyme or reason why, it's just, just because. It works better. If you can draw it with all single bonds, try to draw it with all single bonds. If you don't have enough electrons to go around, now try to do double bonds and then if you have two triple bonds. Does that work 100% of the time? No, that does not work 100% of the time. Does it work 85% of the time? Yeah, I, I'd say it works 85% of the time. There's, there's another thing going on here that we're going to talk about here shortly. But, but generally, <clears throat> if you do all single bonds when you can and then do the multiples when you have to, you minimize your formal charges and you end up with the right structure. But, you know, there are exceptions to We'll talk about one a little bit later, but, but that's what I would probably do, and, and more than likely you will get it right most of the time. All right? Okay, well, that's what you do if you don't have enough electrons to go around. So what's the only other problem I could have? Well, I have too many electrons. So what am I going to do if I have too many electrons? What you're going to do is you're just going to pile them on the central atom. You're going to forget about it. In other words, you're going to give the central atom what we call an expanded octet. So, for example, uh, name that compound for me. Well, it's covalent. So remember I use my prefixes and stuff like that. So this is uh, xenon tetrafluoride. Does anything strike you as particularly strange about xenon tetrafluoride? Well, xenon's a noble gas, right? I thought noble gases didn't form compounds. Well, that's what we thought, too, up until the 1960s. And we actually found a, uh, I believe it was a krypton compound, uh, that actually was formed with fluorine. And, and we didn't expect that. And so then we had to figure out why. Well, something special has to happen to that noble gas before it can form a compound. We'll talk about it in the next chapter. But, yes, there are some compounds with some noble gases. No known compounds with helium, no known compounds with neon. I don't think there are with argon, uh, but by the time you get down to xenon and radon uh, and krypton, then yeah, there are a couple out there. All right, and this is one of them right here, xenon tetrafluoride. Okay, well, let's take a look at that and, and see how what it looks like. So I've got xenon, how many valence electrons? Well, I've got eight. I've got four fluorines, each at seven apiece, took 17. Four times seven, 28, 28 and eight, 36 electrons total. Don't have to add or subtract, there's no charge here. All right, first atom in the formula, generally the central atom, so we'll put the xenon in the middle, put the fluorines around the outside. How many did I use up there? Well, I used up eight, two, four, six, eight, each of those lines in a pair. 36 minus eight is... 28, so I have 28 electrons left. Okay, so here we go. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24. How many electrons around this fluorine? Well, 8, 3, 2, 4, 6, 8. How many around this fluorine? 8, 2, 4, 6, 8, this fluorine, 8, that fluorine, 8, 8 around xenon, everybody's happy, right? 
What's the problem? Well, the problem is I only made it up to 24 if you were paying attention, right? How many electrons do I have left? Well, I've got four electrons left. So I'll need them. Can I throw them away? Can I sweep them under the rug? No. I've got to use them somehow. I can't just make them disappear. I can't create matter, but I also can't just make it disappear. So what am I going to do with those four electrons? Well, what you're going to do is you're going to put them on the central atom. How many electrons do I have around this xenon now? I had 12. Was that possible? Well, I guess it is. Apparently so. And this is what we call an expanded octet molecule. So there are some molecules where you actually can have more than eight electrons around the central atom. And those are expanded octet molecules. All right. So how do I know if it's an expanded octet molecule? Well, you don't have to guess it at the very start. All you got to do is just draw your dot structure. If you have extra electrons left over, stick them on the central atom. If you're going to have an exception to the rule, an expanded octet, for example, in this case, it will be the central atom. The ones around the outside generally follow the octet rule, the exception being hydrogen, of course, which only has two. It's called the helium rule. But those will usually be just fine. If there's going to be something kind of weird and messed up going on, it's always going to be that central atom. So that's how you tell. You, you don't, you just destroy your dot structure, you've got stuff left over, stick it in the middle, like, oh, guess it was an expanded octet molecule. And that's how you take care of it if you have too few. Do your multiple bonds, stick them on the central atom. That's how you do it if you have too many. And if you have just enough, I guess you have just enough. And those are the only three possibilities you could possibly run into. So now you can draw anything that I throw at you. Are there any other exceptions to the rule? You know, kind of making you paranoid here. I gave you a rule and there's exceptions, right? Well, yes, there are some other exceptions. Okay. Um, germanium compounds sometimes have six electrons around them. Um, nitrogen, as I said, sometimes you can have odd electron molecules where uh, you actually have seven around the nitrogen. Those you won't run into in here. There, there's really, besides hydrogen, only two exceptions to the rule that you need to know on site. If you know those, we're going to call it good. All right. The two exceptions are beryllium, which is right here in the periodic table. And it turns out that beryllium compounds, uh, beryllium is happy with four electrons around it instead of eight. And it, it's actually cool with that. Not quite. We'll talk about it, but it just is. So here's beryllium fluoride. Uh, notice I have eight electrons around each fluorine, but I only have four electrons around the beryllium. And that's okay. Don't try to put double bonds in there. Uh, just, just leave it as is. All right. The other exception to the rule is boron. Uh, boron is happy with six electrons around it. So this is BH3. Uh, notice I have two around each hydrogen here. But I only have six electrons around the boron. And again, it's okay with that as well. And those are, your, those are the two exceptions to the rule again. So beryllium, uh, hydrogen of course with two. Beryllium with four, boron with six. By the time you get to carbon, everything needs eight. Okay. But again, you can have some with more than eight. So yeah, it's uh yeah. The world's a complicated place. This is general chemistry. You need general ideas. But yeah, there's always always an exception to the rule, isn't there? But these are the only two that you need to know. Beryllium with four, boron with six. Okay? So I guess uh, the next question would be why? You know, why are there exceptions to the octet rule anyway? Why can I have atoms with more than eight? Why can I have atoms less than eight? Is there something else going on? Well, yes, there is something else going on, and this is something called formal charge. Okay, and this is one way you can calculate uh, the formal charge. Formal charge is kind of a measure of how many electrons an atom has versus how many electrons it ought to have. You know, if, if an atom has as many electrons as it should, uh, then we say it has a formal charge of zero. If it has one more electron, and I'll just I'll quit doing this. 
then what it should, then it has a formal charge of minus one. If it has one less electron, then what it should, it is plus one. All right, so it's it's um, kind of like a charge, but but not really. It's, it's, it's kind of like oxidation numbers, sort of, you know, to a certain extent. All right. To calculate formal charge, this is the formula right here. Oh, it looks like I actually already changed it. That's nice. Okay. Yeah, it was written a different way. I like it written this way. So your formal charge is the number of valence electrons that the atom ought to have. So you look at the periodic table to figure that out. Minus half of the bonding electrons around it. Okay. And the reason why you do it that way is because when you have this pair of electrons between this beryllium and the fluorine, what you're assuming is one of those electrons came from the beryllium, one of them came from the fluorine. So the beryllium really has ownership of half of that pair before it was shared. So that's why you take half of the bonding electrons. If you have lone pairs around an atom here, non-bonding electrons, those belong, like for example, this pair right here, this belongs exclusively to that fluorine. So if I was calculating the formal charge on the fluorine, I would count both of those. So valence electron minus half of the bonding minus all of the non-bonding. And if everything turns out the way it should, you should get a formal charge of zero. But of course, not everything ever turns out the way it should. All right, so let's take a look at this beryllium fluoride. Re remember we said that beryllium is happy with only four electrons. Why is beryllium happy with only four electrons? Let's calculate the formal charge on this beryllium. So how many electrons should the beryllium have? Well, I'll look at the periodic table, and it's in group two. So it has two valence electrons. So I've got two valence electrons for the beryllium, minus how many electrons do I have around the beryllium participating in bonding? Well, I have this pair and this pair, so two, four. So I'm going to take half of those. Do I have any lone pairs sitting on the beryllium? No. So that's where the zero is. Half of four is two. Two minus two is what? Zero. Zero minus zero is zero. So the formal charge on the beryllium here is zero. And that's what it wants to be. All right. The rules for formal charge work like this. If an atom has its choice, it'd rather have a formal charge of zero. If it can't have a formal charge of zero, smaller numbers are better. So plus ones, minus ones, plus twos, minus twos. If it's got to have it, that's what you want. If, if you got an atom with a formal charge of plus seven, that's just horrible. You, you, the further you are away from zero, the more unstable that's going to be. So you want to keep your formal charges down to low numbers if you possibly can, and zero really. All right. The other thing is when you're uh, looking at a molecule and you have maybe two dot structures that are equally viable, okay, but you're trying to decide between which one, the one with the less number of formal charges is better. You don't want a ton of atoms with like plus twos, plus threes, plus fours, minus ones, minus twos, minus threes. You want as few formal charges as you can and you want those formal charges to be small, and you want them to be as far away from each other in the molecule as possible. You don't want to have two atoms next to each other where you've got a formal charge of minus three on one and plus two on the other. Bad situation. Okay? All right. Well, quite often what you can do is you can get a formal charge of zero, and you can get eight electrons around the central atom. And that is the best case scenario. But there are situations, like say for example with our little beryllium atom here, where you have to choose one or the other. You can either have an octet around the eight, eight electrons around the central atom here, or you can have a formal charge that's really low and preferably zero. Sometimes you can't have your cake and eat it too. And the reason why beryllium has, a form, has uh, four electrons around it is because that gives it a formal charge of zero. And that overwhelms the fact that it doesn't have the eight valence electrons. Same thing for boron. Okay. Boron, six electrons around it. Calculate the formal charge on that boron, that BH3. I'll bet you get zero. All 
right? And that's why you have situations where it doesn't follow the octet rule, is because you've got this formal charge thing going on. Uh, this is SO3. Okay, remember I said if you draw with all single bonds first, and generally that will get you the right answer. I said generally. Well, here's a case where it doesn't. Right? This is SO3. Now, this is not SO3 2 minus. This is not your sulfite polyatomic ion. It turns out that SO3 as a molecule, neutral, actually exists as a gas, a sulfur trioxide. So what does it look like? Well, if we drew the dot structure for it, we would get something that looks like this. And, and that's a perfectly valid Lewis dot structure for SO3. I mean, I've got eight electrons around everything here. In reality, this is actually an expanded octet molecule because it really looks like this. I've got these three triple bonds here, uh, to sulfur oxygen triple bonds in this molecule. How many electrons do I have around this sulfur? Two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve. I have twelve electrons around that sulfur. That probably would not have been my first choice when I was drawing this thing. But yet that's actually what it looks like. Why? Why does it look that way? Well, let's look at those two structures. Let's look at the formal charges here on each of the atoms. Okay, so at the same time, you see this oxygen, this oxygen, this oxygen, and I got one single bond, and I got six electrons around it. Do you see that if I calculate the formal charge for this oxygen right here, it's going to be the exact same for these other two? We can save a whole lot of time if we can just all stipulate for that, uh, for that uh, statement. Does that make sense? Okay, so let's calculate this one. So how many valence electrons should the oxygen have? Well, it should have six. Okay, minus half of the electrons involved in bonding. How many electrons do I have? Well, I have two there. I got that pair. So half of two is one. So six minus one is what? Five. Okay. Then we're going to subtract off all these non-bonding pairs that belong exclusively to the oxygen. And there's what? Six of those. Five minus six is what? Minus one. So formal charge on this oxygen is minus 1, formal charge on this oxygen is minus 1, so is this one right here. Okay, what about the sulfur? Well, group 16, so 6 minus half the electrons involved in bonding, so 2, 4, 6 of those, so there's a 6, and I got this pair sitting on that sulfur, so I'm subtracting both of those. So half of 6 is 3, 6 minus 3 is 3, 3 minus 2 is plus 1. So the formal charge on this sulfur is plus 1 in this structure. So minus 1, minus 1, minus 1, plus 1. All right, well, let's look at this structure over here. What's the formal charge on this oxygen? By the way, do you see that if I calculate the formal charge on this oxygen, it's the same as this and this? Because each of them is a double bonded oxygen with two bond pairs. All right, so 6 what I should have, minus electrons involved in bonding here. There's four of them, so half of those. So half of four is two. Six minus two is what? Four. All these count. There's four of those. Four minus four is zero. So formal charge of zero here. Formal charge of zero here. Formal charge of zero here. All my oxygens are zero. What about this sulfur? Well, six minus half the ones involved in bonding, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, no lone pairs sitting on the sulfur, half of 12 is 6, 6 minus 6, formal charge of 0 on the sulfur there. Which one of these is a better structure? Well, this one is actually a better structure even though it doesn't follow the octet rule because I get formal charges of 0 all the way up. And that's, a, that's desirable. Does sulfur always form six bonds? No, it doesn't always form six bonds. Sometimes in molecules it follows the octet rule just fine. Uh, say, for example, in our uh, sulfite polyatomic ion video. But sometimes it does form six bonds. Why would it ever want to do that? Because it gives it a formal charge of zero. So see, you have, you have two things kind of competing here. The atoms want to have eight valence electrons. That's a good thing. They also want to have a formal charge of zero. If they can find a way to do that, that's great. But sometimes they have to make a choice. And that's why you end up with exceptions to the octet rule.
You remember I said that carbon always forms four bonds. I can only think of one molecule where it didn't, that CH, uh, that carbon monoxide. Why does carbon always form four bonds? Because if you form four bonds to a carbon atom and you calculate the formal charge on that carbon, you will get a formal charge of zero and you'll get an electron charge on that carbon. Check it out and see. But that's exactly how it works. And that's why carbon pretty much always forms four bonds. Once you get a little further and you get into organic, or if you get into biology, you start talking about molecules, you know, biological molecules, you will find, generally speaking, generally, nitrogen pretty much always forms three bonds. Not always. Not, not like carbon, but I mean, usually phosphorus atoms typically tend to form three bonds, but there are exceptions to the rule. So you'll see like three bonds and a lone pair of electrons. The reason why is that due to the formal charge is zero. Oxygen and sulfur in molecules will generally form two bonds because that gives them a formal charge of zero. They have two bonds and two lone pairs. Uh, your halogens typically form one bond. This is why you find them around the outside, generally, but not always, like in a perchloric polyatomic ion, it's in the middle, um, the chlorine is. Uh, but generally they form one bond because one bond to a halogen with six electrons around it generally gives it a formal charge of zero. So you look at this fluorine up here. Uh, seven minus half of two. So seven minus half of two, seven minus one is six. 6 minus 6, formal charge is 0. And so if you look in your biology book, if you're taking biology, uh, look at formal charges in molecules, organic molecules, inorganic molecules. Typically, that's what you tend to see. Do you always see that? No, you don't. You know, um, when you get to organic chemistry, you know, I can look at an oxygen atom. I know it's got a negative formal charge. I just know it. I, I deal with it so much. If I saw an oxygen atom with uh, three bonds to it, that's actually got a plus formal charge. And then two bonds to it is a zero. Uh, a nitrogen atom with four bonds to it is going to have a formal charge of plus one. I don't even have to do the math because those are just situations you run into in organic chemistry all the time. So, yeah, you'll see formal charge uh, somewhere down the road again. Uh, but essentially what it is, it's, it's, it, it's another thing along with the lewis Dot structures uh, along with the octet rule that kind of helps you can decide between competing dot structures. Generally speaking, if you can um, draw it with all single bonds, that tends to minimize your formal charges, and that's why I told you that. Um, but it doesn't always work. Uh, you know, the SO3 example there. Uh, sulfuric acid, you can, you, or sulfate polyatomic ion, you could draw as a, a sulfur with four single bonds to the oxygens, and it'll work dot structure-wise. In reality, it's actually two of those bonds of double sulfur-oxygen double bonds and two of them sulfur-oxygen single bonds. Why? Formal charge is what it comes down to. Um, but, again, is it a fatal mistake? Uh, in some ways, yes, but in some ways, no. Uh, I'll explain that a little bit later on down the road, I guess, as well. Um, but if you'll do it that way, as I said, 85% of the time, Draw it with all single bonds when you can. 85% of the time, your formal charges are minimized and you're turning out okay. Uh, but, you know, there's those exceptions to the rule. All right, can you calculate formal charge? Something to think about here before we go. Nitrate. When you drew the dot structure for nitrate, it looks something like this, right? I have this double bond here, and a single bond here, and a single bond here. All right. But if you think about it, I could have drawn it like this. I could have put my double bond here, a single bond here, and a single bond here. Or I could have put my double bond here, and a single bond here, and a single bond here. So here's my question for you. If you were able to look inside a beaker of sodium nitrate or whatever, you know, a solution or something like that, and you had all these little nitrates floating around, what would the nitrate actually look like? Would it look like number one? Would it look like number two? Would it look like number three? Would it be a mixture of all three? Would I have a third, a third, a third? Or is the correct answer none of the above? You give that some thought. We'll talk about it next time, and then we'll talk about why it matters. But, 
uh, we're coming up on 40 minutes at this point, so I think that's a pretty good place to stop. So uh, we'll click right there for now, and we'll see you in the next video.